Okay, roll call. Senator Cooper? Here. Senator French? Here. Senator Cole? Here. Senator Cost? Cole's here. Oh, Cole. And Cole, Cost, we're both. Uh, <laughs> the K's are here. Chairman we're Nethercott. both here. <laughs> Chairman Nethercott? Here. All right, uh, committee members, good to see you this morning. Uh, we are starting here on Wednesday, March 3rd. I think this is the 12th day of the session, which is really day three for us for this March uh, beginning. Great to see you all. And um, thanks for indulging me with, with being a few minutes late this morning, attending to another matter. Um, up next, we have our first this morning, Senate file 75, protective orders amendments. We love protective orders. We deal with them every year. Um, and we're glad to see one again this year. And so Senator Landon, good to see you and presenting once again, another change to our protective order laws, I say with some level of sarcasm, which this committee is certainly accustomed to, um, but appreciate the efforts and the continued conversation about uh, domestic violence in Wyoming and the need for um, the correct and, and uh, parameters associated with protecting those that are victims of domestic violence. So Senator Landon, the floor is yours. Madam Chairman, thank you. It's good to good to be here this morning. It, it, it's kind of fun looking up there. There's there's two Ks, and in the middle of the two Ks is a Q. You know, you got a queen and a couple of kings, and, <laughs> and then we go on out from there. But Madam Chairman, it's been quite a morning. I uh, I had some really profound thoughts uh, typed up for you and uh, hit the delete button, so that's okay. I mean, maybe the second time around will be better. Um, Committee, I bring to you Senate File 75 and just a, a quick little background. Uh, this is an area of the world, uh, the whole uh, world of stalking, protective orders. Um, I reached into it about three years ago uh, because of a dedicated group up in my county, uh, which included law enforcement, uh, legal professionals, social work professionals, and they really did uh, a lot of work to try to reach into our statutes and see where we were with this whole world of stalking. Uh, I brought the bill down and um, um, Senator Nethercott can speak to this. Um, the bill did not pass. It was not ready. Um, that's always tough, you know, when your bill doesn't pass, but we went to work the following interim and the Judiciary Committee took up that issue and did some really great work uh, on this whole world of stalking. Well, so anyway, uh, I had a group uh, uh, come to me, the same group, and they said, um, they, they told me about um, a case that took place just over this last year over in Sweetwater County. It was a, a recent district court decision uh, found that a defendant stipulated stalking order could not be used to enhance subsequent stalking conviction to felony. Um, because no findings of stalking were found at the original stalking protection order hearing. That, that is what got me interested in this whole area. And so I got to talking to some legal professionals and discovered that we really do not in, have in our green books, in our laws, this idea of the order of protection, at, at least in this situation. Um, so, Written protective orders right now, when they are given by a judge, uh, presently advise in writing that a stipulated order can be used to enhance future stalking conviction to a felony level. That's not in our laws either, and that's not what the, what the bill does. Let me take you to the bill uh, committee. I'm trying to stay at a pretty high surface level because we've got legal professionals here who can help take us a little deeper if we need to go. Um, Senate file 75 uh, goes into uh, our criminal procedures statutes 73509 and then it goes into um, our public health statutes domestic violence 35 21 105 with the same language a respondent may make a knowing and voluntary stipulation that a court may exercise jurisdiction over respondent and issue an order pursuant to this section without a hearing 
factual finding or admission that the conduct giving rise to the petition occurred. And then of course, 3521, 105, we do the same thing. Committee, back to the reasoning. Um, I think it's interesting um, when talking to those uh, professionals that I alluded to, uh, how important sometimes these uh, uh, stipulations are in these, in these protective order hearings. These can really take the temperature out of the room. Um, Judges like the ability to do this um, because needless to say, these can be pretty contentious situations. It's good for those involved as well. And maybe the chairman can speak to this being in the legal world uh, because often there is not representation at these initial hearings. And if there is this stipulation it can keep things from getting uh, heated and boiled over. Uh, those involved um, can often um, take off uh, and issue statements that can later be used and they may not even have legal representation there. So just from a surface level, I think these, these uh, orders are a good thing. Uh, they make a lot of sense, even to a lay person like me. Um, Madam Chairman, th that's really what the bill does. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't do a much better job on the front end of that. Um, th there's um, This bill obviously could go a little bit further. There is some precedent from another state that um, allows for the fact that these orders um, can be used in that next level of felony conviction. This bill doesn't do that. Um, and it may be suggested by some people who uh, uh, do this for a living. Uh, they may testify today that you might wanna consider that. Um, I didn't take the bill that far. Um, I do wanna thank the chairman for, um, I reached out right away for her assistance and, and comments on the bill. And that's what it does. It just simply puts into our laws the ability for the judge and and those involved in the case to stipulate this way. Um, I'll try my best to answer any questions, Madam Chairman, and would certainly rely on you to fill in any gaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Senator Landon. Questions for the good Senator? Senator Kolb. Thank you, good Senator Landon. Uh, could you explain uh, how the court gathers the information for these protective orders. I mean, what sources do they use? And then secondarily, um, is due process, are, are, are these folks that are gonna get the protective order ordered against them? Uh, what type of due process do they have or is there any? And I'm asking this because I, I really don't know. So if you could please help me out with that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, great question, Senator Kolb. And, and I get, uh, it, I don't have to get very far off the shore to get into really deep water with this, but this is the initial hearing. Um, and my understanding is that, um, and as I mentioned that if, if this order, if this is stipulated to, uh, there is no finding of, there's no finding of guilt. It's just um, an acknowledgement that acts were committed. Um, and maybe that Maybe the chairman can help me there too. Um, there's enough evidence, obviously, that law enforcement has brought the charge. Okay, so, so that's what initiates, that's, that's why we go to a hearing. Um, and um, in reading our statutes regarding these protective orders, I have learned over these last three years that it's very, very complicated. Um, and it's sometimes pretty frustrating for somebody outside the legal profession to understand uh, why it takes so long, why it takes three of them, um, why it, it's so difficult for um, somebody who is the victim of one of these situations to um, navigate the system. On the other hand, it goes to what you're talking about, Senator Kolb, which is 
what is the protection against frivolous charges being brought? And, um, and I think the, the thing I like about this bill is that it allows uh, for the judges in that courtroom. Um, often there's not legal representation there. So it's the judge, it's, the, it's those involved in the case and they can just stipulate, look, we've got a situation going on here. We're gonna issue the protective order and then you need to go and visit with your attorneys um, and we'll come back at a, at a later date. Hope that begins to answer the question. Well, in particular, I guess I'll just give a situation. Let's just say a person who's made a, a statement of uh, stalking, right? Uh, is it just a statement or does it have to be backed by fact law enforcement? Does law enforcement folks have to believe, I guess, the veracity of that statement or have evidence or, you know, know the, know the case at hand, or is it just plainly a statement by a person saying that someone is, you know, doing these things and I want an order of protection. And that's kind of, I guess, to sort the of root of the question. Sure. Thank you. I'm going to just interject because I think there's a high volume of confusion here. There are two types of protection orders. One is a stalking protection order. One is a domestic violence protection order. Both of those are civil actions brought by a petitioner, an individual citizen who is alleging to be a victim of either stalking or domestic violence. Law enforcement is not involved at all. And so um, an individual can go to the court and they have what's called pro se packets and they just fill out the forms and they ask the court then to serve the paperwork through the local sheriff's office on the respondent of a protection order. There are two options available at that time for a hearing is set. The court can also do an ex parte order of protection if there's enough facts based on um, what is presented in the petition to do an immediate order of protection. Um, if the court does not, the, the judge does not find that, um, they'll just set an immediate hearing. Either way, there's an immediate hearing but there is an opportunity for just an immediate order of protection without a hearing. That's on a very temporary basis. Uh, a hearing is set where the respondent needs to appear in front of the court and answer the allegations, just like any other type of lawsuit. Uh, there are two options at that time. A full evidentiary hearing takes place where testimony is elicited from both the petitioner and the respondent and anyone else that may be relevant to the particular matter at hand, or the respondent can stipulate already, and there's a box to check um, to entry of the order without a finding. And the significance of all of that has to do with gun rights. Because if someone is subject to one of these orders of protection, primarily domestic violence, they lose their gun rights while under such prohibition. So that really is the issue underlying uh, people's hesitation to stipulate to orders of protection. Um, when the good Senator brought the bill, I said, why is this necessary? Because this is already available to the litigants in the courtroom, the petitioners and the respondents. And there's literally a box to check on the form. Um, but you will walk across the state to every jurisdiction and have here a different experience that then reaches out to legislators to, to bring further laws. Um, it's kind of confusing, but law enforcement isn't involved in this space. Now, if an order of protection is entered, then there is a lawful court order that prohibits someone from doing something. If the respondent violates that lawful court order, that's a crime. And then that can be charged by law enforcement. And that's when that process starts. And that's a whole different piece where then the prosecutor's office pursues the defendant for a violation of that protection order. Madam Chairman, thank you for clarifying. And all of that piece of, of what leads up to finally filing for that protection order um, almost always involves law enforcement at some point along the way, but I really appreciate that clarification from the chairman. Um, the, as mentioned several times, it, this is a very complicated world. Um, and it's nice to have um, the legal profession alongside as we consider this bill. Uh, my understanding uh, in visiting with a couple of judges is that it's, it's pretty inconsistent out across there. And some of that, uh, at least a couple of the judges thought this would be a good idea 
to, to have in there. Uh, did not lobby me to that effect, but they thought that it was something that would maybe give us some consistency out across the state. So I hope that we'll keep working on that, Senator. Hope if, if the bill goes forward and I promise to get back to you in a better way. Oh, good senators, I did just email all of you, including Senator Landon, the form that the courts have that is a universal form um, that everyone has the opportunity to fill out and you can see it. And that's online too. So, but you all have it in your inboxes as well. Any further questions for Senator Landon? Yes, yeah, Senator Cooper. Um, we have the same language for 73509 and 3521105. Is that correct? And the difference being we're inter interjecting this language into two different statutes? Is, is that what we're doing? Yeah, if you'd speak into your mic too, Senator Cooper, and maybe bring it down and closer to you so everyone can see. Senator Landon, did you hear that question? Uh, Madam Chairman, I did not. The question really is understanding why there's a difference between the two statutory sections referenced, um, Title Seven and then Title 35. Um, Senator Cooper, uh, this is the 73509 is in our criminal proceedings. Uh, acts. Uh, 3521105 is in our, our public health statutes under domestic violence. Does that, uh, so there's really two areas of law that um, where you find these situations. And so this, this seeks to, to make consistent in both areas of law. Does that make sense? Senator Cost, did you have any questions? All right, Senator French. Um, yes, thank, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Can you break this down for me? So, so, so how does this procedure work? Say a woman is being stalked. Does she go to the court or does she go to, and then ask for protection um, without a hearing? I mean, how does she get to the system? I mean, does she go to an officer police officer or uh, does she find her way to the court? Maybe she didn't know how to do that. I mean, break this down for me. And then that protection order, uh, does the judge say to the other, the person that's alleged to be stalking, you can't come within 600 feet of the, the, the person or a thousand, whatever they determine. Can you break that down? Or Simplify it a little more for me. Sure, uh, Madam Chairman, um, Senator, great question. Um, I've dealt with um, in my former job uh, in the Dean of Students office at a college up in the center part of the state, ran into several situations. And in part, that's why I became interested in this part of the law. Uh, it, it, um, it normally, Normally, the, the, those who are the victims of stalking or a domestic violence situation, in my experience, usually reach out to law enforcement. That's who they call. Um, and I, I believe the way that works, um, not always, but I believe that, that at that time, uh, an officer or someone in a, a sheriff or a, a, um, a police force office would indicate to that individual that they can go to the court and seek that protective order. Sometimes what comes into play before um, actual charges can be brought against an individual, um, there has to be documentation, several forms of documentation before uh, before law enforcement will take any further action. But in the meantime, the chairman is exactly right. Uh, a person can go directly to the court to, to seek a protective order to keep that individual away from them. So I, I hope that helps us get started on that conversation, at, at least, Senator. Follow up, Senator French. Yes, Madam Chair. 
Um, so at that point, the, the judge can, he has a range of things, I assume, uh, not being, knowing much about the court, a, a range of things that he can do or she can do, say, you can't do this or you can't do the one that's doing the stalking or the domestic violence. You So there's a range of things that, is it up to the judge or is it in certain sideboards on, on what they do on that initial phase? There is, and, and I don't have the details of all the things that they can do there. I can certainly get that to you, Senator. Uh, but Chairman, you might have some thoughts on what uh, what all the judge can do, but uh, there there is some latitude there for the judge to take up the, the case on a case by case basis. Um, but normally, um, there's a pretty standard thing that they do initially to keep somebody away from somebody else. This whole world, uh, by the way, this this whole world of stalking, um, and we just had a case two weeks ago here in this county that was really tragic. This, this is a, a crime that's escalating, unfortunately, across our country. And I don't, uh, it's, not, it's not two generations ago. This is not uh, somebody sitting out their car in front of the front window. Um, this, the behaviors that lead to these sorts of things, which almost always escalate, uh, go all the way to all sorts of devices, all sorts of capability to intrude on people's lives. Um, this is a this is a very serious and growing crime in our culture for whatever reason. I, I think it. I think a lot of it is technology that is allowing uh, people to intrude intrude on other people's lives, and and it's keeping the legal profession busy. It's keeping uh, our courtrooms busy, and. Um, so this is a very minor little piece of something that, uh, that may help the courts, may help our legal profession, so that at the very least, these, uh, the respondent, uh, you know, the, the victim, at least they don't do something in the courtroom that day that might um, not benefit them later on. Um, it gives time to cool things down a little bit and for, for legal counsel to be involved. But anyway, that's, I digressed a little bit, but, but this, is a, this is a very important part of our laws. And again, I really appreciate the Judiciary Committee's work. I think it was two years ago that, that we really did a lot of work there, so. Senator Cooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator, back to the to the language in the bill itself. Uh, a respondent may make a knowing and voluntary stipulation. So this is just given the respondent the ability to agree with with the order without without a hearing. He just agreeing to go along. Is, is that correct? Is that what I'm reading? Okay. So it has nothing to do with the whole issue of. It has a lot to do with it, but. We're not addressing the issue of stalking or anything else. We're just giving this respondent the ability to waive his right to a hearing, if, if you will. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank that, you. That, that's exactly right. Um, we won't get into anything else beyond that, um, although it may be suggested to you, uh, Madam Chair, and to Senator to even take that a little bit further. Um, but I will tell you that uh, those who defend um, in the courtroom probably don't want this to go any further than that. Um, if that stipulation is tantamount to um, admitting to guilt, for example, I can see where some in the legal profession would not want that. Um, so that, that's for another day perhaps, but. Further questions for the Senator? All right, thank you, Senator Landon. With that, we're gonna go to Ms. Chambers, who is on Zoom uh, from the Attorney General's office. Hello. Welcome, Ms. Chambers. Good to see you this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Kara Chambers, and I am with the Wyoming Attorney General's office, and I am the Director of the Division of Victim Services. 
Um, I'd like to try to address uh, several of the questions that came up, but I, I thought it might be helpful, uh, Madam Chair, with, with <laughs> your permission to sort of give a quick background of what our office does uh, and the services, because we do have so many new committee members, if that would, with, with your permission. Absolutely, we do have four bills this morning, um, but absolutely, I know that there's already people filling in to discuss a bill that'll be third up today, probably around nine o'clock, gentlemen, is when we'll hear that bill, um, which will probably take significant amount of testimony due to the excitement. So um, be brief, please, Ms. Chambers, but we're, we're yes. welcome this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to let those of you know, uh, the Division of Victim Services is, again, part of the Attorney General's Office, and our main function is to fund the 62 victim service programs across the state. So we fund 24 domestic violence sexual assault programs. That's one in every county and one on the Wind River. Um, and then we have various victim witness coordinators housed in either law enforcement or prosecutor's offices. We also fund the child advocacy centers uh, and CASA programs that work with child victims. Um, our interaction with, with this bill and sort of victim or um, protection orders in general um, is that our office is in charge of making sure that the form that Chairman Nettercott sent you is, is accurate. And so with this bill and adding this section D to both, uh, and in fact, there are three types of protection orders. I wanted to clarify that there are domestic violence protection orders that are found in Title 35. And then there are stalking and sexual assault protection orders that are found in Title Seven. So this language would be adding this stipulation to all three types of protection orders. Um, speaking to uh, Senator French's questions about how do victims access this, uh, typically if they either go to law enforcement, but a lot of times victims will seek out one of those 62 programs uh, to get help from a victim's advocate to help them navigate that system. As, as Chairman Nettercott mentioned, there's a pro se form that they can fill out uh, requesting protection uh, really all that this bill is, is doing, in my opinion, is adding uh, some formality to a procedure that happens quite frequently. Um, I do have the opportunity to uh, speak with judges, uh, one judge in particular quite frequently, um, about what this looks like in circuit court. Um, and the comments I've received is that this would be very helpful to the judiciary to just clarify that uh, you know, a respondent has rights, that this is not an admission of guilt of any of the underlying um, behavior that was alleged in the protection order. And what will often happen is respondents, if they don't disagree with, with the protection order, they just don't show up. And so this is just a, a quicker mechanism uh, to, to add to that little box that's already on the form that says, look, this is what happens when you have a stipulated order. Um, uh, and, and that once it's stipulated, just like if it had been found it, after an evidentiary hearing, that it has full force and effect of law. And I think that's really the key. And with that, I could go on, but I know you are crunched for time, so I would just stand for any questions about uh, the process for victims. Questions for Ms. Chambers? Committee, you'll get to know Ms. Chambers well. She appears in front of the committee often, and we appreciate her expertise. So thank you so much, Ms. Chambers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Right, with that, we'll go to Ms. Muir, who I know wants to speak to this bill. Ms. Muir, please come forward. You can stay up there with Senator Landon. Senator Landon, just stay close. Oh, thank you. I don't think we'll have any other public comment, so okay. I, think, I think there's room enough for all of you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Ms. Muir. If you'd introduce yourself to the committee, we'd have happy to hear your thoughts. Good morning, Madam Chairman and committee members. My name is Tara Muir. I'm the Public Policy Director with the Wyoming Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, I was here a couple of days ago. I worked closely with Kara Chambers. Um, a lot of the funding her office uh, uses goes to our member programs. We're not a government agency. We run a um, our members are small nonprofits, one in every county, um, and it's those advocates, it's that crisis line that many victims will call um, when really bad stuff is happening that we've talked about. They may not, a, a law enforcement may hand them the card of one of our centers um, so they can have a good confidential conversation about how frightened they are and what should their next steps be? What could their next steps be? Often that's when they download the pro se form. Chairman Nethercott has talked about, um, fill it out, help them fill it out. 
um, ask them about the depth of everything that's happening because that's the worst thing for survivors of these kinds of crimes is nobody takes the time to really find out the fear level, the dangerous level, um, but our advocates and our, our programs can certainly do that. And, and then that helps that protection order have a full picture. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes out there. Victims come off as being very emotional and frightened and blowing things out of proportion. What I'd like to get across today is usually that's just the tip of the iceberg. Even though it sounds horrible enough, some of the things that happen to them, often it's been years of these things happening to them. Their goal and the whole goal of the protection order process, which began back in the 90s-ish, maybe 80s. Um, so they've been around for a long time. And from survivor's perspective, just get the abuse to stop. I may not even want to divorce the guy, but I need the abuse to stop. My children need to stop watching this and I can't seem to make it stop on my own. So the foundation behind protection orders is the court with the power of the state with Wyoming being the small town with long streets, it's the neighborhood, it's the community coming around that survivor and saying, we wanna make you safe. And we're gonna bring out the guys with the guns and the badges to enforce the protection order, hopefully. There's also great inconsistency across this state about how protection orders are enforced. That's another day, um, but that's the purpose. So the abusive party, the respondent says, oh, geez, you're serious. <laughs> I guess this, what I thought was just, you know, kind of kidding around and being a tough guy. And I'm stereotyping here too. Um, often it can also be men who are victims. That's also less talked about, but it can happen. So that's the purpose behind these orders. Should be really simple. We think we always have this really simple process, but the devil is always in those details. And if you've ever known a person who chooses to be an abuser, their, their goal isn't just to hit someone once and oops, that was a mistake. They're very focused. I have to control this person because I'm either afraid of what they're gonna do if I don't control every tiny move. Um, and they'll fight tooth and nail to protect what they perceive as theirs. I'm sure we all know those kinds of folks. But that's what the goal of the protection orders are. Yep, there's three different kinds. What has given rise in the attorney community is this case out of Sweetwater County. Um, shouldn't name counties, I think, but <laughs> uh, my apologies. This was a stalking protection order between neighbors. And maybe last night, as I'm pondering this big mess of statutes we have, maybe it's time to make the neighbor versus neighbor thing something different. And stop messing around <laughs> with stalking and sexual assault and domestic violence protection orders where people, predominantly women, they are highly impacted by these crimes, can get clear safety. Protection orders also supposed to hold the offender accountable that's the whole other part of why all these big federal funding streams come into our state, is if we could get that abuser to change his or her ways, we all wouldn't have to be going to court every other day with a custody battle or a protection order request. So the, the, the foundation of a lot of the domestic assault laws are to have swift and sure consequences to someone who takes, never takes no for an answer, the abuser. So what has happened in the case that gave rise to some of this was the judge said, it's a stipulated order. We cannot use it to enhance a felony stalking penalty. Even though the statutes are clear, Chairman Nethercott, you know, yeah, it's clear. That's how that should happen. This particular order, and I had emailed this case to all of you last week. I think it was last week. Um, that's what was ruled. So there was a lot of panic. Wait a minute. These protection orders, if you violate them, should have the same full force and effect as if it had had a hearing. The catch in all of these is, does that respondent have the opportunity for a hearing? Firearms protections kick in when there is just the opportunity for the hearing. Um, if they waive their right to it, done. It's still a valid and enforceable protection order. So Senate File 75, 
does a lot of good, saves the court a lot of time. Recognizing stipulated orders should happen. In some counties, they refuse to do them. So they said, well, you're helpful. But we're here today to say it doesn't go far enough. And we um, put forth an amendment to just add one sentence that says this order made pursuant to this section shall be valid and enforceable. It's just kind of codifying what we all know and learned in first year of law school um, and have the same force and effect as a protective order entered with findings of fact and conclusions of law. The respondent had an opportunity for a hearing and chose not to have one. That was when they should fight it. And when it becomes a valid order, every law enforcement officer, every judge should know you violated it. So everything kicks in. If it can be used to enhance what you did, it can be used for that. Committee, do you have the amendment from Ms. Muir? I did not print it off. I did email it with the case. Ms. Muir, your, your amendment's quite simple. We can write it down if you can for the committee. What page and line number would you like that word that wording added? Page two, lines after line th or on line three, after the period, just insert that sentence. Would you like me to read it? Mm -hmm. An order made pursuant to this section shall be valid and enforceable and have the same force and effect as a protective order entered with findings of fact and conclusions of law. Just want to add real quickly, the Sweetwater County case mentioned, okay. Thank you, Ms. Muir. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Did everyone get that amendment? <laughs> Senator Cost has. Does everyone understand what it does? No. I'll go ahead and explain it when we discuss it on the, uh, when we work the bill, which I think that we will. I just want to make sure we don't overcomplicate the issue. I also, Senate Judiciary Committee members, you'll hear these issues brought before us oftentimes um, where judges get it wrong. <laughs> and that's what happened here in Sweetwater County. So uh, having practiced in jurisdictions across the state with stipulated protective orders, that judge got it wrong. And here we are, um, hopefully solving it, but I'm not sure that we are. Uh, so. <laughs> So we shall move forward. Um, you know, as a point to Senator Landon, and Ms. Muir likely knows this, we can send people to the death chamber with a plea of guilty without a hearing. So the fact that a circuit court judge feels uncomfortable um, enforcing a protection order with the knowing waiver of a hearing to have a protection order entered against them seems contrary to how the process works, but it is what it is. So we'll try to fix it. And I appreciate the good Senator bringing the bill. Ms. Muir, I appreciate your amendment. I think it's, I think it solves the concern as mentioned. Um, any final questions for Ms. Muir? Do you have the amendment? All right, thank you, good senators. Thank you, Senator Landon, Ms. Muir. Thank you. Further public comment on this bill? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, I'm not sure if there's any more people on Zoom. One of our program attorneys was going to try to join. I'll text. Uh, I have a, looks like we have two hands raised, Miss Jean Core or Jeannie Core, and a Haley Dunn, if you'd like to enter the room now. We'll just wait a minute as they come through here. Ms. Dunn, we'll go ahead and start with you, uh, just because you came into the room first here with the technology. If you would uh, turn your video on, and we're, we're anxiously awaiting your thoughts. And we're running a little short on time, uh, so if you could be brief. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Haley Dunn. I am a program attorney for the Wyoming Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, what I wanted to talk to you today about was specifically the practical implication of this um, as a party case. Um, I've had two protection orders in the last year or since August of 2020 that this case came up 
one of which the judge did allow us to stipulate, um, but with an understanding that he doesn't know what's gonna happen if it goes to district court. And we just agreed on that. I would like to note that in that case, we had a respondent who um, very much wanted to stipulate. He had other legal issues that if there was a finding of fact that he had committed this act of sexual assault, though the sexual assault case, it would have drastically impacted his other um, legal issues. So all he wanted to do was stipulate to this case. So not only did it help my client, it also helped the respondent be able to avoid that um, further enhancement of his other legal issues. The second case didn't work out as well. Um, the, it was, this was a stocking order of protection and it was denied um, because the judge said we were not allowed to stipulate and uh, he did not say, he said a stipulation was invalid. So we either had to go to court on this issue Ms. or figure Ms. something in which jurisdiction. It was in Sweetwater County in front of um, Judge Jones. This is our job. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Um, in that case, we ended up just having a no contact order issued by the district court, which made it so my client did not have the level of protection um, as she would if it was a protection order, a stipulated protection order. Um, to try to keep it brief, I will end it there and ask anyone if they had questions. Ms. Dunn, as I understand, you indicated in that second case, the stalking case with Judge Jones, um, that that respondent slash defendant had co-occurring cases going on, one a significant criminal case, is that correct? No, Your Honor, that was in the first case of sexual, or not Your Honor, sorry. I do this is my first time testifying, so Madam Chairman, um, no, that is not, in the first case, the sexual assault protection order, that's when he had concurrent uh, legal issues where he was a defendant as well. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Ms. Dunn, they tease me in the Senate and usually do a tally of how many times I call the chairman, Your Honor. I do it by default. <laughs> so, uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing joke of me of me doing that as well. I understand completely default to those terms. Ms. Dunn, thank you. Um, you know, one piece, and just as I have so many of the professionals dealing with these cases, I was always frustrated when I was representing a criminal defendant potentially charged with a crime associated with a victim that could be eligible for receiving a protection order when they, very serious charges facing that defendant and that was under very significant bond conditions and likely incarcerated that still they were advised to seek a protection order, which required the defendant and the victim to appear again in court, um, which made a very challenging situation to navigate, afforded me the defense attorney an opportunity to cross-examine the victim, which arguably I have a duty to do, which may not be with the domestic violence uh, you know, professionals want actually to have happen, but thinking through that process sometimes is difficult. And I always was frustrated when that process was selected uh, because I certainly had the opportunity to cross-examine that victim, which would not have been in her best interest. Yes, you're, or yes, Madam Chairman, that's something that we've seen. In this case, it was actually a different issue, different victim. <laughs> Interesting. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Dunn. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Ms. Cora, good to see you this morning. If you would introduce yourself to the committee and hear your thoughts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Jeannie Cora, and I also am, pro am a program attorney for the Wyoming Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, a big part of my practice is protection orders, and I appear in circuit courts around the state of Wyoming uh, representing victims of those crimes. I wanted to address a little bit about why people choose to do a stipulation. We've talked about the criminal reasons that someone may not want testimony be put on the record. But there's lots of other reasons too. Uh, people choose to stipulate to an order, victims choose to stipulate to an order to reduce trauma, um, to not have to testify in front of their abuser. This is especially important for minors. We do sexual assault protection orders for really young minors and having to appear in front of their abuser is super traumatic. 
And for respondents, there's lots of reasons. Beyond criminal reasons, there's also family law reasons. Often these protection orders are also um, happening with a corresponding family law case and not having a finding issued against them of domestic violence or sexual assault or stalking um, can be in their advantage in a family law case or a divorce that goes forward. So there's a lot of reasons why people want to stipulate to orders. I would estimate that for every one evidentiary hearing we have for a protection order, we have three or four stipulations. But that ability to stipulate is really different between courts around the state of Wyoming. Um, in domestic violence protection orders, just as Senator Nethercott said, there's a box to check on the form that says that we agree to stipulate without a finding being made. That box doesn't exist on stalking and sexual assault protection orders. So there's a lot of question about whether that's something that is available. And the ability to stipulate isn't in either the Domestic Violence Protection Act or in the Stalking and Sexual Assault Protection Act. So this bill just codifies what it is that we are already doing. And then the second half of the issue is, so what happens when someone stipulates? What is the enforcement, what happens. And it's pretty clear in statute that the enforcement should be the same, that a validly entered order, which the person voluntarily stipulated to, because you have an opportunity not to stipulate. You can choose to have an evidentiary hearing at any time at that beginning process. You don't have to stipulate if you don't want to. So though that same enforcement provision should exist for orders that have been stipulated to. Um, Ms. Court, another yes, an please. An unfair question, but I'm going to pose it anyway. Do you think the court got it wrong in Sweetwater County? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. That makes two. Great. Thanks. And so, and the, lastly, as far as enforcement goes, Senator Nethercott brought up uh, the gun provision. Whether that gun provision applies is not stipulation or not. It is actually more the definition of the relationship of the parties. So the um, Enforceability of a stipulation doesn't change the gun provisions in, uh, in a protection order. And unless there are questions for me. Thank you, Ms. Kaur. Very helpful uh, testimony. Questions for Ms. Kaur? Yeah, I believe there'd be significantly more stipulations, but for federal law associated with those gun prohibitions, kind of a hands tied situation that may not be relevant in particular situa uh, situations, but Little choice there. Uh, thank you, Ms. Core. Appreciate your help. Any further public comment? All right, seeing none, public comment is closed. Committee, back to you. Moved by Senator Cost. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Kolb. All right, is there an amendment? Yes, sir. Senator Cost. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the amendment I would like to propose would be the one that uh, Tara Muir has suggested, which on page two, line three, after the period, insert an order made pursuant to this section shall be valid and enforceable and have the same force and effect as a protective order entered with findings of fact and conclusions of law. Also on page two, line 12, the same after the period. Judy, did you get that? I got it up to enforceable. After enforceable, could you read it again, please? Senator Cos, I will have you send it to her, but for purposes of clarity and her kind of writing it out now, since she has it, if you could um, just read again what you sure. said after the word enforceable. Okay. After enforceable and have the same force and effect as a protective order entered with findings of fact and conclusions of law and then a period. May I read it back? Yes. An order made pursuant to this section shall be valid and enforceable 
and have the same force and effect as a protective order entered with findings of factual, I'm sorry, I didn't type that one right, of factual and conclusions of law. What's the word after findings of? Fact. 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 Just fact. I Just F -A -C -T. Well. And then you, you have it. All right, Perfect. thank you. Thank you. All right, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Senator Kolb. Discussion on the amendment? Question being, was there a discussion, Senator Kolb? Oh, I've kind of, yes. Chairman. You're voting aye. Uh, you know, I, I do vote aye. But I'd just like to say that uh, every cloud has a silver lining. And as actions happen across our state, in this case in Sweetwater County, we are in fact the forefront of positive change for things uh, of this nature. I'd just like to add that to defend Sweetwater County. Thank you. <laughs> They have been on our list for quite some time, Senator Kolb. All right. Any Every further discussion on the amendment? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That motion has passed. Back to the bill. Any further amendments, committee? Call for the question. Question on the bill. Roll call vote. Judy, please. Senator Cooper? Aye. Senator French? Aye. Senator Kolb? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Chairman Nethercott? Aye. The bill has passed with, as amended with five ayes. Madam Chair, Chairman, thank you, and committee, thank you. Um, I'll be prepared when we get to the floor to hopefully do a little better job of keeping it in the corral and really appreciate all the help this morning obviously made it better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Landon. Okay, great. Um, Thank you, members of the public. We have um, a number of committee members who are presenting bills and other committees, and they, they are, Senator Cooper has left to do that, and Senator Cost is as well. Uh, so we're just coordinating uh, the meeting as we have some senators leave to go to other committees this morning. Representative Jennings, I see you're in the room, and I believe that you're here for Senate File 96, and Senator Hutchings was here as well. Is she, is she, around right now? Does she go back to committee? Could you grab her if you would? And we might swip, uh, change the agenda around a little bit as a result of losing some committee members um, <clears throat> to start with that bill next, which is Senate file 96. And the reason for that is because my bill would be up next, Senate file 110. And so I would move from the chair to present my own bill, but we have two committee members absent, which would make kind of a silly committee meeting. So we will rotate our schedule around because Senator Hutchings is here and available. Um, and we'll do this bill with my presence. And then when we complete that bill, we'll get back to Senate file 110 when Senator Cost and Cooper are probably back and Senator Cost can chair the meeting at that time. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. And there's an understanding as to why we did that quick little switch. Um, mm -hmm. I saw you were here, Senator Hutchings, and so knew we could we could do that easily. So buy you a little bit more time here. Welcome, uh, Senator. Senate File 96 is up next for the members of uh, the public who are watching, and this is homicide amendments. Welcome, Senator Hutchings. Thank you, ma'am. Senator Hutchings, couple things. If you would get your mic on, I don't think we, that's do that. there and bring it up close. Long or short? <laughs> um, uh, the middle? All right. <laughs> well, actually there's just a short version. So I thought it would bring a little levity to the stress of moving back and forth from committees. Um, this bill is pretty straightforward. And um, I thank all the members of our legislature who uh, sought 
that way and wanted to co-sponsor. This is an act relating to crimes and offenses and creating a new offense for first and second degree murder, providing definitions and providing for an effective date. Um, this bill is um, personal to me. Uh, it affects, at least at this time, three of our legislators, um, two in the Senate and one in the House. Um, our current, one of our senators is now raising a child from a, a woman, his sister-in-law, who was killed by her husband, and um, she was pregnant. My cousin was killed by her husband when she was pregnant. He served, um, I think, five years, and he's out. And I believe um, Senator Baldwin's sister-in-law's husband is now out. This bill would create a dual homicide um, for the murder of a pregnant woman and her unborn child. We have first and second degree murder with penalties and... Um, I don't know how much more you want me to go into it. I am will sit for questions, but it's just that straightforward. Thank you, Senator Hutchings. Questions, Senators? Sure. Senator Hutchings, I might just ask you some questions. Please. Um, to help. I know that you have cared deeply about this issue and worked hard on this bill. Thank you, ma'am. And one of the issues that I think is important to recognize is that the definition and the crime applies only when someone with the intent to kill causes the death of another life. Right, ma'am. Regardless of if that life is the pregnant woman or the unborn. And there is a gap in our law associated with the uh, death of the unborn in where the mother survives. So there, there is a bit of a gap and that is, that is true. And something I think is important in the criminal code is to acknowledge that just because a defendant uh, is unsuccessful um, in their attempts to kill the woman, mm -hmm. the mother, uh, but, but kills the unborn that they should be without punishment, period. It should be noted, however, that our laws do address a sentencing enhancement associated with um, the death of the unborn and the woman. And that's, a, I think, a 40-year sentencing enhancement. Yes, ma'am. So, so we do acknowledge it, and we acknowledge it very seriously. And I just, I just kind of want to communicate that, because uh, like, I think those are very important facts to distinguish. And so... Uh, I appreciate you bringing the bill because I do think it addresses that gap that we have when the mother doesn't die. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things I did, and I appreciate you bringing up the fact that I've been working on this for over four years. Um, during the, our last session, I had a lot of opposition and I said, I'm gonna go and investigate and find out what I can do to make this bill better. So what I did is I took the bill to our district attorney and um, she took it to, a, I don't know if it was a conference of district attorneys around the state. So prosecutors got to look at the bill and they liked it. I got input from them, especially on the definitions. They like the definitions and they're following the bill. They love it. And um, um, I'm just very appreciative of them for their input and help with this bill. This is the prosecutors. I know it just touches my heart. <laughs> Senator Hutchings, <laughs> Senator Cole. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Senator Hutchings, yes, sir. I, I appreciate your perseverance. I appreciate your dedication, the time you've spent. This is a tricky thing to thread. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, I, but I think it's definitely a hole in the law needs to be addressed. And I think this is a great, uh, it's improving. I, I support it uh, and I, and I uh, will try to do what I can to help it move forward because I think it's, it's definitely a, a problem. It's an issue and that's tricky, but we, we need to do something. 
in, in the right way. Thank you, Senator Culp, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Culp, I, I appreciate that. One of the things I found out upon investigating this CDC lists murder as a number one cause of death in pregnant women. I was surprised. And as I went across the states and looked at this crime, it's happening, just it's happening too much. And Wyoming is one of, um, well, if we pass this, we will be the 39th state to do so. So um, I appreciate your support. Senator French. I would just, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Hutching, I would just echo what uh, Senator Culp said. It's a great bill. I, I respect the fact that you brought that forward and I just fully, fully support you in Thanks. the bill. Madam Chair, appreciate that. Yeah, Senator Hutchings, I just want to press upon the point because we also have a little bit of time here. Um, <laughs> so I'll be waiting for my committee members to come back. Yeah, uh, for my committee. <laughs> and their vote is open. Uh, of note, the three of us are co-sponsors, but um, that the number one cause of death for pregnant women in the United States is homicide. And, and that I think is an important fact. And so dovetailing to our previous bill on domestic violence protection orders, uh, certainly an issue in our country and in the state. And it, it is very uh, a stark and harsh reality when we understand that of all the things that can be a challenge for a, a woman who is pregnant, that homicide to be their number one threat is certainly appalling. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you bringing that issue up as well. And forgive me, my brain just went, it went, empty, but um, so I can bring back what I was thinking. Um, oh, my thought was um, that this is the ultimate in domestic violence. Women suffer from beatings and um, emotional trauma and to be killed when you're pregnant. Um, like I say, it's just the ultimate domestic violence. Well, thank you, Senator. With that, we'll go to public comment. Uh, I do see we, we're going to start with Zoom and then go to the folks in the room. Uh, I representatives, I see that you're here and to acknowledge uh, Representative Jennings and Representative Nyman. Did you want to provide any comment on the bill or just here with your support? Representative Jennings, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's good to be back. Um, <laughs> I think the last time there was uh, uh, the, the results hopefully will be different than today. Well, you've been on the Joint Judiciary Committee for quite some time. Good. Four years. Yeah, that's right. That's right, sure. Representative Jennings. So I appreciate the committee here in this bill this, this morning. Um, in my own personal experience, I had um, grew up with two people that this sort of thing happened to. And um, I believe in both cases. Um, in one case, the mother was killed and... and um, father spent 15 years because there was there was no penalty for the child um, and in the other case certainly further along um, it involved a, an accident but uh, alcohol and stuff like that involved and both the mother and the father were killed and um, the person spent virtually no time and so I rise in support of this I think it's long overdue like I said, uh, 39 states, as Senator Hutchins says. And um, so I'd like to see this move forward, support it very much, stand for any questions. Thank you, Representative Jennings. Any questions for Representative Jennings? Representative Nyman, welcome. First time in front of the, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Good to see you. Welcome to the legislature. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, um, I guess I just uh, step up to, uh, to support this legislation because the folks in my district, District 1, wholeheartedly support this. And I just want to be a voice and advocacy for them as well and to, to bring their views down and share them with you guys is that this is a desperately needed piece of legislation. And we appreciate the work of the committee and we especially appreciate the work of Senator Hutchings and want to just come and just simply share our support for that and uh, to have let you folks know that we're all behind you 100% in this and for her as well. So all right, thank that's you. it. Thank you, Representative. Good to see you. All right. Thank you all. With that, uh, we're going to go to Miss um, former Representative uh, Marty Halverson, who is in the waiting room and on um, Zoom. If you would start your camera, Miss Halverson, uh, good to see you this morning and 
Thank you. With us, please. Thank you, Chairman Nethercott uh, and members of the committee. Wyoming Right to Life fully supports this bill, and we urge your I vote. Uh, I am president of Wyoming Right to Life, and our thousands of Wyoming members and friends uh, support this bill, adding unborn child and child in utero to these statutes. This will make Wyoming the 39th um, state to recognize the preborn child as a victim of violence in first or second degree murder. When a murderer, murder victim is a pregnant woman, her murderer should be charged with dual homicide. And unless there are any questions, that concludes my testimony. But as I said, on behalf of Wyoming Right to Life and its members and friends around the state, we ask your strongest I vote. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, former Representative Halverson. Any questions for the representative? Senator Kolb. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you for your comments, uh, Ms. Halverson. I, I wish we wouldn't have been 39th. I wish we would have been first. I'm glad we're here now. It's water under the bridge, I suppose, at this point, but I'm certainly very supportive of this and thank you for your comments. All right, thank you, Senator Kolb. Um, with that, is there any uh, other folks in on Zoom in the waiting room that would like to speak? Okay, we see, I see Ms. Lichtenfels. And is there anyone else in the waiting room that would like to speak in Zoom? All right, seeing none, uh, Ms. Lichtenfels, welcome. If you could start your video. Uh, or if you don't have video, um, go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee and, and share with us your thoughts. Here we go. Sorry, I'm not, not the best on Zoom. Uh, hi, my name is Christine Lichtenfeld. Uh, I'm a practicing attorney. Uh, I also work with Chelsea's Fund, which helps uh, women fund abortions when they need it. I'm testifying today to voice my opposition to Senate File 96, and I focus on several things. One, you've already uh, mentioned uh, that uh, uh, Wyoming Statute 62109 already exists with uh, sentencing enhancement. Uh, second, I wanna note that the high rate of natural miscarriages means pregnancy loss should not be further criminalized. I also worry that this bill does not protect pregnant women. Uh, and I don't believe that this uh, bill makes our uh, state of Wyoming a better, more free place to live. So to go on, to expand on my comments, uh, Wyo Stat 62109 already provides for the sentencing enhancement as you have, as you have already identified. Uh, and the Wyoming Constitution at section 15 requires that the penal code shall be framed on the human principles of reformation and prevention. By deleting the requirement, 62109 has a requirement that the person knows uh, that the woman is pregnant, but these uh, proposed amendments do not have that requirement. Uh, and that uh, both uh, takes away, does not help preventing, pushing the, uh, the principle of preventing. And it does not, in your conversation before, you were saying how important it was to prevent the murder of pregnant women. Well, if people don't know that they're pregnant, then we're, it's not serving that purpose. Uh, secondly, according to the Mayo Clinic, uh, 10 to 20% of known pregnancies end, end in miscarriage. And the actual number uh, is considered much higher uh, because many miscarriages occur so early in pregnancy that a woman doesn't realize she's pregnant. Uh, and in fact, a 2017 study published by the peer-reviewed BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth Journal, uh, found that 43% of women who have had children have also had miscarriages. This high rate of natural miscarriage demonstrates that the causation of the miscarriage by the alleged criminal act uh, is not provable to the necessary criminal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. So what does that mean? It means that either these amendments invite a miscarriage of justice or else these amendments serve no actual purpose of establishing a proper penal code. Uh, another concern, important concern in this bill is that unlike 18 U.S.C. 1841, 
Uh, and unlike other numerous state statutes uh, that provide for criminal penalties in 18 U.S.C. 1841 uh, has many of the same provisions as this bill. Um, so in other state statutes, these amendments provide no protection to the pregnant woman. Uh, 18 U.S.C. expressly does not allow the prosecution of, quote, any woman with respect to her unborn child. And it also forbids the prosecution under the statute of any person for conduct in relation to an abortion with the consent of the woman. Uh, similarly, North Dakota's statutes regarding offenses against unborn children to refer to a nearby state uh, with strong conservative credentials uh, excludes the pregnant woman from a person who may be prosecuted under the statute and likewise excludes abortions from being subject to the statutes. Uh, that these proposed homicide amendments fail to include, include these exceptions makes them nothing but dangerous to pregnant women. Uh, for example, a woman feeling overwhelmed by a pregnancy because she doesn't have the financial or emotional resources to have another child, or maybe she's desperately ill, um, uh, such a woman might decide to take her own life uh, but fail, and then she miscarries. Uh, under these proposed amendments, an aggressive prosecutor could decide to prosecute the woman when she is already desperately in need of support, not prosecution. Uh, in summary, we all love Wyoming and we want the state where the government does not regulate or even more importantly, prosecute beyond what is necessary and what it can prove. Uh, here, the sad truth is that miscarriages occur all the time Wishing it to be otherwise doesn't make it so. And a fetus is very different from a child that is born. Uh, our criminal system, the most powerful control of the government over free individuals must not conflate the two. Otherwise we end up with an authoritarian government tragically inviting miscarriages of justice. So I ask you to vote no on uh, Senate file 96. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lichtenfels. Ms. Lichtenfels, um... Just from my own curiosity, are you, are you in Wyoming? I am in Wyoming, yes, Lander. Wonderful, I, I just, just, I'm not familiar with those funds, um, so um, curious. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Questions for Ms. Lichtenfels? All right, thank you, Ms. Lichtenfels. We appreciate hearing from you. All right, is there anyone else in Zoom that would like to um, provide public comment? Ms. Steinberg, if there's anyone else who's even thinking about it that's in the waiting room, because I see a number of people, please raise your hand right now. If not, I'm not going to come back to you. Um, all right, seeing none, Ms. Seidenberg, if you would please start your video. Welcome to the committee. And Ms. Seidenberg, if you would introduce yourself and then uh, share with us your thoughts. All right, seeing um, we are now uh, concerned with time, Ms. Seidenberg, we will come back to you if you're able to get your video on and your sound on. So, but with that, we're gonna to go to public comment in the room. Anyone would like to provide public comment in the room, if you could stand up and please come forward. <laughs> Representative Winters, I assume you're in favor of the bill. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. We appreciate hearing from you. We'll, we'll, bring, we'll come back to you. We've got two more bills to work through this morning. Um, so we'll come back to you here in just a minute. Anyone else in the room that would like to speak, speak now, or I'm gonna close public comment, sensing the hesitation, please come forward. Ms. Burt, welcome to the committee. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. Raise your hand if you're thinking about providing public comment and still making that decision. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Ms. Burt, welcome. who testified in terms of her legal concerns about this bill. Um, I am a lobbyist for NARAL pro-choice. We oppose this bill. Um, and you know, one of my concerns as I was listening to testimony is there were several uh, people that spoke about incidents where people where men um, murdered pregnant women and they got five years or they got off or they got 15 years. Um, that is not a problem in Wyoming. Wyoming has an excellent 
uh, statute that does protect uh, pregnant women. Um, Wyoming statute 6-109 is the existing law that provides enhanced penalties for crimes against pregnant women. Those enhanced penalties are not only the penalty of murder or secondary murder, those penalties add 40 years. And I believe the chairman did uh, mention that. So men in Wyoming are not getting off for 15 years or five years. Um, they can do a life sentence, they can do life without parole, and they have that enhancement. Um, so this is not an easy state. And this, those particular statutes were crafted very carefully when they were crafted in order to protect women. Um, I think that um, the, uh, the current bill, while I understand the concerns about that gap, I do understand those concerns, this bill is much too broad. And the purpose of this bill is to actually add, add unborn child into our statutes. And, and I think that's the purpose of the bill because it does not protect women in any way that is a greater way than what we already have right now. Um, murder in the first degree in Wyoming already allows for um, life imprisonment without parole, uh, life imprisonment, the death penalty. So imposing a second sentence really has no practical purpose in this particular case. I think that if there were concerns in terms of the law that we presently have, I think that those could be addressed with a very na narrow, tailored, narrowly tailored bill, not a bill that is this broad. And the previous um, testifier also said that there, is, there are so many things that, that a prosecutor could do with a very broad bill like this. Women could be prosecuted. A woman who commit, tries to commit suicide, attempts that during her pregnancy, could be prosecuted under the way this is written. Um, so those are, those are my concerns. And obviously our concerns from Mayrell is that this bill is about abortion and fetal personhood. It's not about protecting women. Um, and as an advocate for women, I would hope that that would be our primary course here and to do something in a more narrowly ta tailored way to address this concern. Ms. Burt, when you read the bill, do you believe that it requires uh, the woman to die for a defendant to be prosecuted? No, no right. I don't. No, and, and, and that is a concern because as we look at other bills, attempted uh, second degree, attempted murder, there is not a death penalty for either one of those bills. But under this circumstance, if the woman didn't die and there was a miscarriage, my belief is that there could be a death penalty under those circumstances. And I think that's a disproportionate punishment in terms of how we look at our statutes right now. And I would have some grave concerns about that dip, disproportionate punishment. All right, thank you. I, I, Ms. Bird, I've also heard the testimony and the reference to a miscarriage. And I, I find that that is um, missing the point in that in order for a defendant to be prosecuted under this bill, they have to have the intent to kill. And, and so this is not a conversation of she upset, you know, he upset the woman and she was so emotionally distraught suffered a miscarriage as could be alleged. I mean, there's an intent to kill somebody. No, and I, and I understand your, your point, Madam Chairman, but we also have in this bill is that they don't have to, neither the woman nor the um, perpetrator has to know that that woman is pregnant. So you cannot have an intent if you do not recognize that pregnancy. I don't know, Ms. Bird. I'm pretty familiar with felony murder, and I think I'm, that would apply. I'm sure, I'm sure you are, Madam Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ms. Bird. Mm -hmm. Senator Kolb. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you for coming here and explaining your, uh, I guess, your position. However, I'll take a uh, disagree with the idea that uh, it's some protection thing. I don't believe it's protection. I'll tell you why it's not protection. It's because there's been a crime committed, in my mind, against an unborn. And this is a penalty. So it's not, obviously, you know, people did something at one point that led this question to come up was what happened and what penalties would be associated with what happened. So we can't, this isn't going to stop the crime. This is a penalty in my mind for the crime if it becomes law. So I just don't uh, get the part of a pen, you know, it's not going to stop anything in my mind. Things will happen. This is just a penalty 
to kind of square the square the corners on a problem. And the problem is there should be, in my mind, an enhanced penalty for the uh, taking of a life in this particular case is lined out in this bill. And we have a hole. And I, I think on the next breath that you said, well, this is too broad. I mean, I'll just, for argument's sake, maybe it is. However, no one's come to the table to address this whole law until these kind of things happen. And I find it unfair that folks that could have come up and suggested something that would have covered this whole didn't. So I'm, you know, I mean, I'm at a loss. So I, I'm, that's why I'm a supporter of the bill. Are laws all perfect? No. But this goes a long way to squaring, squaring the hole that we currently have in the law for certain situations. And, and I think there is protections built into it. Uh, but I do appreciate you coming here and explaining to me your point of view, because I do need to hear all sides of the issue. But I'd like to end with that. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairman, Ms. Senator, and, and thank you for your comments, sir. Um, I guess what I would say in response to that is I do think that our laws do carry an adequate penalty at this point in time with the enhancement of those sentences. And I think that's the purpose of those laws to address that issue when we enhance those laws for pregnant women. Ms. Burt, just for a point of threading that needle, that woman does have to die in order to get that sentence enhancement, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you, Ms. Burt. Thank you. Appreciate it. You bet. Senator Cooper? He. I, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I think you just answered my question. My, I understand the enhancement on, on, uh, on the murder charge, but on, I understood you to say, Ms. Burt, that in the case of attempted murder, there is no enhancement. And that's what this would do. Is, is am I reading that correctly, Ms. Burt? Madam Chairman, uh, yes, that's my reading of the bill. Is that in that particular case? And that's what I was speaking to when I said a more ter narrow, narrowly tailored issue within this bill. But that's my understanding. Yeah, Senator Cooper, my interpretation of the bill allows for the prosecution of a defendant who with the intent to kill a woman, a pregnant woman, a woman uh, doesn't kill her, but in fact kills her unborn child and allows for the prosecution of that conduct. Where with the intent to kill, he's unsuccessful in killing her, um, but kills the unborn child. All right, thank you. All right, any further public comment on this bill? Representative Winters, did you prepare a speech? Any further public comment? Okay, come forward, please. Welcome to the committee. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. I'll keep this brief. I hadn't really planned to speak, but Sharon Breitweiser, also with NARAL Pro-Choice Wyoming, I just wanted to add a couple of other comments. You've seen me here at your committee before on bills like this. These bills have been filed since I believe the first one was maybe back in 2006 when then Senator John Brasso brought one and we've always had concerns. Um, I think some of the discussion we had a couple years ago on this bill was perhaps some unintended consequences. And I'd just like to say, I still think that that's the case. And maybe this is a little far-fetched, but I'm just concerned, or well, I'm concerned about a lot of things, but adding to what's been said, and I'll try to keep this brief. Um, a woman who miscarries, we, who miscarries, we hear, hear about people that are in, very ugly uh, divorce proceedings, uh, custody disputes. And could a woman who has a miscarriage at any stage of pregnancy then accuse someone, whether it's uh, an ex-husband, whether it's a coworker she doesn't like, of having tried to kill her at some point during that pregnancy? And yes, there is a burden of proof for the prosecutor, but I just, I worry about that. There had also been some concerns expressed a couple years ago by senators about vehicular homicide. And I know this law uh, as written, this bill as written does not go into that aspect of the statutes, but I still am concerned that a woman 
could miscarry after being in a car wreck and then accuse someone of having intentionally tried to hit her and kill her. Um, I just think there are perhaps, even with this broader approach of we want there to be a penalty, even if the woman doesn't die, there are opportunities for some abuse. So just wanted to raise those concerns in speaking against this bill as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing those concerns. Appreciate that. Any questions? Senator French. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, just a comment. I think that's why we have the, uh, the judicial system, the courts, the juries, uh, the prosecutors, the, 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 those defending, defending those that are accused. So I put my trust in on what you brought up that the court would look at it, a jury of peers would examine everything and, uh, you know, and then prosecutor defense side of things and the judge that, you know, the evidence would come up that, well, why didn't you report something? You know, why didn't you say, why didn't you make a report um, or contact the police uh, when you were abused or this or that? I think I put my trust in that jury system to look at all the evidence in uh, that type of instance and make a very educated decision on that. I mean, that's why we have those juries. Uh, I've sat on a couple of juries in my life and, uh, you know, the juries, the jurors take it very serious and they listen and they're like, wow, okay. They examine everything back and forth. Might take days, you know, uh, uh, one time I was on jury for a couple of days, we went back and forth and we discussed everything. So I put my faith in them. So that, just a comment. Thank yeah. you, Madam Chairwoman and Senator French. Thank you for, for sharing those thoughts and thank you for serving on juries. I know not everybody's as enthusiastic about that as you apparently have been. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. Any final public comment? Got two more bills, Representative Winters. All right, thank you, Representative Winters. Appreciate that. All right, with that public comment is closed. Committee, back to you. Good job, Senator French. <laughs> we're, we're oddly short stop. Senator Kolb stepped out for just a minute. Madam Chairman, I do apologize for interrupting, but I believe Ms. Seidenberg on, out here in Zoom land um, has unmuted herself effectively. Ms. Seidenberg, I apologize. Public comment is closed. Um, thank you, Ms. Creech, for bringing that to my attention. Unfortunately, we're just out of time. Uh, it, the bill has been moved and uh, lo looking for a second. I'll second the bill. Um, we're going to keep the vote open. Senator Kolb is coming in. Is there any uh, amendments on the bill? All right, seeing none, uh, roll call on the bill. Senator Cooper? No. Sen no. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. No. No. Uh, Senator French? Aye. Senator Cole? Aye. Senator Cost? We'll keep the vote open okay. for him. And Chairman Nethercott? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Uh, so the bill passes um, with three ayes, one no, and one open. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your work on Senate File 96. Senator Cost indicated he would be 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. With that, we're going to go to Senate file 110. Senator Cobb, I'm going to put you in a very uncomfortable position here where you are going to chair the meeting as I present this good little bill. As a result of kind of the challenges associated with this, I would normally go down to the front, uh, but just to kind of keep some order here, I'm going to stay here for now. Um, and present this bill to you, uh, which, which I normally would not do, but since this is your third meeting, <laughs> we'll, we'll change the course for the moment until Senator Cost comes back, who, would, who I would give a full chair to and step down. Uh, good senators, this is an easy little bill. Uh, there's no opposition to it. 
and it's small claims procedures. And really what it does is it fixes what I think is an error in the law. And I've consulted with the circuit court judges and other practitioners about this concern. Um, the law originally went into um, effect limiting the ability to serve a defendant in a small claims action outside of the county where the dispute occurred. So for example, what that looks like on the ground is that um, I, a resident of Laramie County, go to Albany County for the day and uh, you know, rack up a bill of $4,500 at the local uh, restaurant and don't pay and leave. And certainly that's a crime, but taking that out of the, out of the mix and, move, and go back home um, to Cheyenne Laramie County. The restaurant that I um, did not pay for would not have the ability to sue me in small claims court in Laramie County. They'd have to try to find out when I would be coming back over to Albany County in order to serve me with the paperwork. And that's kind of silly. So this fixes that problem and allows for service of a defendant anywhere within the state um, in a small claims action. So not very exciting, but it does fix a problem in the law. So I would stand for any questions. Senator Culp. Uh, no questions. Okay. All right, seeing no questions. Uh, is there any amendments on the bill? Roll call vote on the bill. Did, yes, we have them. Oh, do we have it moved and seconded? I'd move the bill. Senator Cole moved, seconded by French. Thank you, Judy. Okay. I'm not used to being this quick on this. Uh, Senator Cooper. Aye. Senator French. Aye. Senator Cole. Aye. Senator Cost just walked in. Uh, 110. Aye. And Chairman Nethercott. Aye. The bill passes as uh, with five eyes. All right, thank you, committee. Uh, Senator Cost is chairing the meeting now. Good senators, that bill seemed pretty simple. Um, the bill in front of you now is Senate File 101, Pin Registers and Trap and Trace Device Authorizations. This bill is a little bit more of a policy question rather than remedying a situation in the law. So I wanna make sure this is more formal. Senator Cost, do I have permission to proceed? Madam Chairman, you do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So stepping back in time a little bit, um, Senators, the in the 70s, the Division of Criminal Investigation was created really with its primary purpose to investigate and prosecute um, drug crimes as a result of the drug trade uh, really affecting Wyoming in a pretty significant way. As part of standing up that agency, that criminal investigation agency, they were also authorized to do um, different types of investigative techniques, uh, primarily what's called uh, trap and trace devices. And what is a trap and trace device in essence? That is the ability to ping essentially or make an inquiry to the telephone company, uh, which phone number is calling which phone number. So it's, it's not, it doesn't reveal any really confidential information. It doesn't have the ability to hear the contents of the phone conversation. It just is able to determine which phone is calling which phone. It doesn't even have the ability to know who is using the phone. It's just which number is connecting to which number, a technology that's been around for a very, very long time. That's called the pin register trap and trace device. The law as currently written is limited to the use of this uh, law enforcement tool to drug crimes. And that has really hampered law enforcement's ability to investigate more serious crimes. And so what this bill does is it expands that limitation from drug crimes to crimes of violence. So investigating serious crimes where there's an ability still to see 
if a suspect in a homicide case is calling someone else. Uh, they have to, so law enforcement has this suspicion that they want to get this information as part of their investigation. Um, they have to go to the local prosecutor. So an attorney for the state is the one who has to make the application. And you can see that um, requirement on page two, line 10 and, and 13 in substance in that A. And so the attorney for the state, so, the, so the, the police officer has to go to the local county attorney or the district attorney's office and say, hey, we're investigating this type of crime. We need this additional investigative tool. The district attorney has to agree. The district attorney then has to go apply to the local magistrate or judge, get authorization for the ability to do that. That's the process that it goes through. Um, and a probable cause standard applies just like it does for anything else. And again, the limitation, that's okay. It happens all the time right now for the investigation of drug crimes. So we wanna know if one drug dealer is communicating with another drug dealer and that can really help understand the drug conspiracy further. We're not accessing the content of those communications and that's what's really distinguishable here. Um, again, the purpose of this bill is to expand the scope of that to all violent crimes so that we can see uh, those, those pieces the onus for the bill came really, I mean, why now as opposed to 10 years ago? Great question. Um, but really, it became kind of paramount where there was a uh, suspect on the loose uh, who was a violent criminal. Um, law enforcement's eyes and ears were open and they were trying to track him down. And they were unable to do so because he was a suspect of a violent crime. Meanwhile, another law enforcement officer unsuspectedly came into contact with this suspect and there wasn't the ability to really inform that law enforcement officer to warn him about the dangerous individual involved. And had they had the ability to use this very old law enforcement tool, um, that officer's life would not have been exposed. Now he wasn't killed, but it certainly created a very dangerous situation that could have been avoided had law enforcement had this tool in the toolbox allowing for their ability to get a trap and trace authorization device for violent crimes. I'd stand for questions. Are there any questions? Uh, Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Chairwoman. <laughs> you can call me Senator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, is this infringe on the right of privacy at all? Is there a, it's, I mean, obviously somewhat, but it, do we, is this a, a in your opinion, I, I suppose I'm asking a silly question here, but is this defendable that we would go ahead and do this and we wouldn't have any other issues, say, uh, with Supreme Court issues or such? Uh, I'm in favor of this kind of action. I just uh, wondered with your long expertise in law, what were your thoughts on that? Madam Chair? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Kolb, that is the question. Does this extended authorization and application of this law enforcement tool trigger the Fourth Amendment for unreasonable searches and seizures and or the right to privacy? And the answer is, it certainly does trigger those protections. And that's why that process applies here of having to go through your local district attorney, county attorney and elected official to then go through the local court system to demonstrate that there is probable cause to justify the use of this investigative technique. Um, those are those Fourth Amendment protections and that's that process. These cases are challenged all the time. Um, there's always Fourth Amendment jurisprudence coming out for the entire country's history. Um, this bill, I believe, complies with the Fourth Amendment and those processes isn't consistent with that case law. The question is whether or not um, you know, in all types of cases where a warrant is obtained to search a home, did the officer really have the requisite probable cause? Should the judge have signed that? Um, and those issues will always be debated, but that requirement to prove that up um, is, is there. Again, this is limited in scope to not um, getting the contents of communications, which is I think where that greater Fourth Amendment right to privacy protection remains. Um, where law enforcement's not able to hear the telephone call. That's a whole different level of investigative tool. That's not what's in this bill. That's, that's, a, that's a wiretap. That's a really big deal that requires a high burden 
in order to tap into someone's phone line and hear their phone conversations. This is just a trap and trace device which sees which phone call to which phone call, phone number to phone number, not the contents. Go ahead, Mr. Senator Cole. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is, are they, do they have the ability to do this to cell phone traffic? Mr. Chairman, through you, yes, they do. Yep, so it applies to any type of telephonic device. Thank you. Senator French. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Nethercott. So is this, this is uh, limited in its scope, just to add the, the um, trap and trace and to include crimes of violence. Is this correct? They have other means to, for lack of a better word, surveil somebody. Um, so this is narrowly focused, am I correct? Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman. Uh, Senator French, it is narrowly focused and it's even more narrowly focused to recognize that trap and trace devices are currently authorized under law that law enforcement can do, but they can only do them for the investigation of drug related crimes. And they cannot do them for violent crimes, which I think is somewhat absurd that they're not allowed to use that tool to investigate a homicide, but they can do it for a marijuana operation. You know, when we're looking at our values of society, that doesn't seem to quite square up for me. Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Chair, I, I have a question on what you just said, uh, and in relation to what the bill actually says, it says a probable cause for a person's arrest for a felony or a violent crime. It replaces that three different places here in the bill, and I I have a concern with that because is it any felony or is it just violent crimes? Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Senator Cooper, if you could, on page two, lines two through five, the crime of violence is defined. Um, what would be a policy question for this committee to consider, and I would have no objection to, but something to consider uh, is on line four, where it says, or property of another. So that goes beyond potentially a crime of violence against another person, uh, but also goes to or, or property of another. Now, when you're investigating crimes and somebody's doing felonious um, actions on your property, it probably is connected to your person as well, but um, that's a piece for you to consider that it does expand that scope to or property. Um, and it does expand it to felonies, right? To all felonies, which I also would submit to you as appropriate when one is trying to investigate a crime of embezzlement or um, at a felony level. This is not misdemeanor type crimes. They're not going to that kind of effort for a misdemeanor type crime. So it is felony type crimes. It takes effort, you know, it takes work to go get one of these. And so is the crime on a, you know, when they're evaluate the amount of investigative resources to devote to a particular case, what are those crimes that they're that they're looking at that for? You know, that said, um, in argument with discussing the bill, oftentimes there's serial burglars um, who are going around burglarizing uh, really industrial sites, stealing large amounts of copper, and they're good at it. Um, so this isn't your one time you have an intoxicated 21 year old who goes and, you know, steals something. Uh, this is you have a sophisticated uh, thief who is committing felonious th you know, theft and th they're trying to struggle to, to determine who it is. They have a suspect and they wanna be able to avail themselves of a trap and trace device to get more determination as to who that is. So again, that's a policy question to you if you wanna limit it to felonies or limit it just to crimes of homicide or aggravated assault, um, you know, that's, that's the policy question for you. I, I, you know, are favorable to giving tools to the toolbox with judicial review, support the full felony piece. Any follow up? Okay. Senator Cole, Senator Cole. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Nethercott, I would like to point out for the record, the need for this did not come out of Sweetwater County. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, I have one question. Uh, like Cheyenne, uh, the area we live in is very close to the border. How does this work across state lines? Is it, it, is it honored by states or is it only limited within the state for the tracing? Mr. Chairman, it is limited within the state. So any state court judge only has state court or statewide jurisdiction. So if somebody was trying to get um, a cell phone or any kind of telephone, and again, it's not the contents. I want to make that very, very yeah. clear. Um, well, which phone is connecting to which phone? If one of those phones is from Montana, I think there'd be a challenge of jurisdiction there and they could not do it. Thank you. So criminals will get drop phones from other states. Any more follow up? Okay. Is there anybody on uh, Zoom that wants to testify? If there is, please have their hands up. I don't think there's anyone. I don't think so, but I will be fair and check. Doesn't look like anybody. Is there anybody in the room that would like to testify? Well, you're off the hook on all all accounts. What's your pleasure, board? Move the bill. Okay, is there, it's been moved by Senator Cole and seconded by Senator French. Is there any discussion? I have. Okay. My only concern with it is, is, is just this, a felony or a crime of violence, excuse me. And I'm, I'm, Horn on whether we should um, be a little more specific on that, because there are some felonies that that are, are simply not crimes of violence that that um, may not warrant this type of intrusion um, on on personal privacy, and um, so I, I'm kind of on the fence on that particular word as it appears in three different places here. So that's, that's my comment. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where we go with that. So I'm guessing you're not ready for an amendment, but maybe after talking later, you might be ready for an amendment on the committee of the whole. I, I would say, let's bring this to the floor and, and have a really good discussion because I'm sure that there'll be some thoughts out there on it. Um, in my vast experience of 12 days now. I, I'm not sure that this is the right language yet, but it's pretty darn close. So thank you. Anything else? You can take over, or do you want me to continue? Senator Cole. Well, just, I see this as an issue of organized crime, but the question of not violent crime, it seems to be organized crime. I think that's what the, the intent to me seems to be, but I look forward to further debate with my experience of say odd 13 days so thank you <laughs> any other discussion any other discussion hearing any, no other discussion uh let's have a let's please have a roll call vote on senate file 101 pen registers and trap and trace devices authorization senator cooper aye senator french aye Senator Kolb? Aye. Senator Cost? Aye. Se Chairman ne Nethercott? Aye. So Senate Bill, Senate, uh, one of, Senate File 101 passes with five ayes. <clears throat> All right, thank you committee members. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Cost. Appreciate your help this morning. Uh, with that committee, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>